Romans chapter 8 once again this morning. Romans chapter 8. We're making our way through the book of Romans. And uh, Lord willing, we'll be finishing chapter 8 today. And uh, next Sunday, before launching into chapter 9, the following Sunday, next Sunday we will be observing the Lord's Supper in the morning service. So uh, maybe uh, during the course of this week, spend some time to prepare your heart uh, to uh, remember what Christ has done for us on the cross. So that'll be our focus next Sunday morning. So Romans chapter 8, and uh, before we get into the preaching of the Word this morning, Let's bow together for prayer. Let's commit our hearts unto the Lord. Pray that the Lord would give us a holy stillness and uh, would focus our attention on what He has for us today. Let's all pray. Oh, Father, we thank You that in the saving of our souls, and in the ultimate keeping of our souls, that salvation is the work of God from first to last. Father, we sang some wonderful songs this morning about the strength of your salvation, that you will hold us fast, and that though our sins are many, your mercy is more. Where sin has abounded, praise God, grace does much more abound. Focus our hearts upon these overwhelming realities today. Cause us to rejoice in the Lord. May we uh, be built up and strengthened by getting our eyes on our Savior today. I pray above all things that He would be glorified, that He would be made much of. Father, we pray that you would draw sinners to Jesus for salvation today and strengthen Christians in the unchangeable realities of who our God is. Lord, we commit our time to you. We pray that you would bless us. We pray that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, you know that beyond the, the exterior of what we try to communicate by by our face, by our dress, by our words. You know the burdens, the needs that we've come to this place laden down with. And so, Father, I pray that you would apply the sweet grace of the gospel into every heart today. We commit these time, this time to you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans chapter 8 starts with the great propositional truth to set the tone for the entire chapter if uh, this, when it says that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And then the chapter moves along, laying down the proof of this wonderful reality. It uh, proclaims the unchanging reality of the absolute sovereignty of God over all things. And we saw that in verses 28 to 30 from all of eternity past and for the countless ages of eternity yet to come, everything is moving along according to the purpose of God. And that is the only way that you and I, if you are a believer, that is the only way that you would be able to say all things are working together for good. In the here and now, God working things together for your good, if you're a believer, is what is described in uh, verses 20, uh, 29 and 30. You're being conformed unto the image of Jesus Christ, that he might be the firstborn, the preeminent among many brethren. And ultimately, it, it is all moving toward every child of God, every believer will be glorified. These are wonderful and rich doctrines. These are doctrines that have precipitated a whole lot of ink to paper over the centuries of church history. 
And uh, here are truths that the believer, if you know Christ as your Savior, these are realities that you should be holding close. They are precious truths. But invariably what happens is these great truths that we should hold so dearly, the devil manipulates us to argue about them and to uh, by, by misunderstanding and we treat them as theological hot potatoes to toss around and to debate and uh, to have our various uh, argument propositions about. And that's to our shame. These realities are to be held close. They are for the believer's richest thoughts and meditations. They are not fodder for argument. They are not fodder for debate. They are so that we would rejoice in who our God is. So then verse 31 starts out, What then shall we say to these things? What shall we say to these things? And whenever you have the truth of what God says, the rich theological truth of what God says, man will say something. My question for us today, in light of where we've been over the past several weeks, is exactly what the text says. What will you say to these things? What will you say? The unbeliever Here's what God says and says various things. The unbeliever says, I have no time for that right now. The unbeliever says, I don't think I believe that right now. The unbeliever says, no, I don't think God would do this. Or the unbeliever might say, well, I will only worship a God that, you know, and, and take it from there, creating a God according to his own imagination, which is exactly the same as what the heathen would do as they craft a god out of metal or carve it out of wood. No different, a, thought, a god of our thoughts and a god of our own carvings. When we create a god according to what is pleasant and acceptable to us, that is idolatry, no matter how you slice it. That is idolatry. The unbeliever responds in various ways. The believer embraces what God says because God said it. The believer uh, embraces the truth. The believer meditates on the truth, holds the truth of God close. Theological truths such as this demand meditation and they demand heart response. Last week, we considered four heart responses to verses 28 to 30. First of all, it says, uh, if God, the first thing that we say, if God is for us, who can be against us? What a wonderful truth. Because of Jesus Christ, the believer, you are able to say, hallelujah, God is for me. God is for me. God is not against me. The devil, what does he do? The devil uh, invades your mind and tries to convince you that for some reason something has happened and God's against you. God is out to get you. God is trying to, uh, bear, to, to, uh, to wear you down. Dear believer, God, no matter what your heart may be trying to tell you, no matter what the devil may try to tell you, dear believer, God is for you. That does not, that cannot change. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 says that in Christ all of the promises of God are yes and amen. But it, uh, God is always for you. You know, I can, I remember, uh, and it's amazing how time flies, but I remember a few years ago that I, I had hip replacement surgery and uh, the days following were painful days. And I remember the physical therapists that, the, first of all, they came to the house and they did in-home physical therapy. And then I went to the, uh, uh, to the facility and I did physical therapy there for a few weeks. And I remember that those physical therapists came in and they were wonderful. But they were having me do exercises that hurt Right? And some of you know, you've been there. You know exactly what I'm talking about. But I knew that this person 
She knows what she's talking about. She knows what is best for my recovery. And yes, it hurts. Yes, these are muscles that are trying to rebuild. And, uh, and it's going to be painful in the moment. But if I push through the pain, there's going to be a reward of greater function in the end. So I trusted that even in the pain, that it was with purpose. Even though I didn't understand always how it worked, and most of the time I didn't, but I can trust that this person knows, um, you know, you multiply that infinitely and think of God and how God is sovereignly working events together in your life as a believer. And many of those events are hard things. Many of those events are painful events taken individually. But as a Christian, you can trust God. God has a good purpose. He's making you to be more like Jesus. If God is for us, who can be against us? What does that mean? Does it mean that no one will ever oppose us? Wouldn't that be nice? If as a Christian, it meant nobody would ever oppose you. We'd say, oh yeah, that would be nice. But actually, that would be a bad thing for us. It wouldn't be good for our Christ-likeness. Jesus told the disciples, he said that they would face opposition. He said, when you face opposition, don't be surprised. People are going to reject you. People are going to hate you. But understand, they rejected me and they hated me a long time before you. We look around the world and there are tens of thousands of believers who are being imprisoned, who are being tortured, believers who are at the knife's edge of death today simply for the crime of being a Christian. That is so foreign as, uh, as uh, in, in American Christianity. This is so far off of the radar of our experience that I think few of us even have the slightest idea, myself included, and we don't think about it as often as we should. We need to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are facing these difficulties. This has been the case down through the history of the church. Tertullian said the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. As a Christian, you will be opposed. They may, they, you may even be opposed simply because of your faith. But what does it mean when it says, if God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for you, the opposition, no matter what the opposition is, nobody can possibly Turn God against you. Hallelujah for that. Hallelujah for that. You know, they, somebody may turn your, uh, may, somebody may turn a friend against you. Somebody may turn an employer against you. Somebody may turn one of your neighbors against you. And you know, some of you have faced the very difficult situation of even somebody in your own family turning against you. People can turn other people against you, but there is nobody, there is not a man on the earth, there is not a devil in hell. If you're a Christian, that can turn God against you. Hallelujah for that. God cannot be against you. Then it said, we saw, uh, the next thing is said is that Jesus Christ came to die for us. We see that in verse 32. So first thing we say, if God is for us, who can be against us? The second thing we say is Christ came to die for us. And if God has already paid the price for your soul well, with the precious blood of Jesus, why would you think that he would hold anything good back from you? If he already paid the ultimate price, why would he hold anything that you that is good for you back from you. We saw in verse 33, the next thing that we say, hallelujah, God justifies us. The highest court has already ruled. And in union with Christ, you are declared righteous as a Christian. No charge can be brought against you, uh, can be brought against your soul's standing with God. 
Psalm 103 and verse 12 puts it this way, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our iniquities from us. That our, our iniquities, we will never face our iniquities. Our iniquities, our sins have been paid for. They are under the blood. We have been clothed with the righteousness of Christ. We say the next thing that we say, verse 34, Jesus Christ has completed his work. It says he died, he rose again, he sat down at the right hand of the Father and makes intercession for us. The work of redemption is complete. There is nothing left for you to do. You have, there is nothing you can add. You can, there's nothing you can do that could add to your salvation. It is finished. And if there was anything left for me to contribute... I would mess it up for sure. The work has been completed. Today, I want to see the final thing that there is to say that the believer says about these things. So Romans chapter 8, I want to pick up our reading in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? The last thing we say, He eternally loves us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things. If you mark in your Bible, that word in though it has only two letters, is a massive word. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I am persuaded, he says. I am persuaded, verse 38. What persuaded the Apostle Paul of these things? He is persuaded by what God has said. Again, the truth of God that demands thought, that demands response. What shall we say to these things? The last thing we say, God eternally, unchangeably loves us. Humanity, we thrive in an environment of love. Don't we? We thrive in an environment of love. Uh, you know, even as a, a fish, the fish's element is in the water. You take the fish out of the water, it struggles, it can't breathe. We thrive, we, we need an environment of love. Now today, people have a very twisted notion of love. Uh, people today have the concept of if... Somebody loves you, that means they will never say anything negative toward you. Never say anything negative toward you. Uh, but instead will always be affirming toward you. And will always be positive toward you. Um, and I remember playing football my senior year in high school. And I'll tell you this, we were not good. We were not good. Uh, first game of this, I, I got to the school uh, about a week late. We had moved to that area. And they had already had the first game of the season. And there was a guy who was the star running back. And uh, about the same size as me, same color. I had hair back then, by the way. Both had red hair, all right? And first game of the season, broke his leg. First game, right out of the gates. He's done. Now, the very next week, we have a new student, and guess what? He's the same size as this guy that just got taken out. Both has red hair, and the team with the guys in the school were saying, the Lord has provided. Little did they know, I stink. <laughs> All right? I'm not good. I'm not good. Now, I played on the team. I was always good enough to make the team, never good enough to get substantial playing time. That's been, my, that's been the way sports has been with me for my entire existence. 
Now, so we were not good. And I remember it was, a, it was a night game, Friday night game, big game, and we were getting crushed. We was an away game. We're getting crushed. And, you know, I can't remember the score, but it was ugly. We were not winning this game. No chance. And the cheerleaders behind the, our bench, our cheerleaders, uh, you know, are chanting something like, our team is the best. You can't beat us. Blah, blah. One of my teammates, no joke, he turned around and said, stop cheering. We're horrible. <laughs> You know, uh, we have this idea that, oh, if you really love somebody, you would never, you always only say positive things. Parents are told today that, you know, the best way to raise your children is never tell them they're wrong. Never tell them that something is bad. Um, and just take that vocabulary right out, take those words right out of your vocabulary because you don't want to speak anything negative to your children. They just need to be directed. They need to be, you know, in, they need to be affirmed and just engage in a directive dialogue with them. Now, I will tell you, as a child, I got engaged in some dialogues. <laughs> And, uh, you know, especially if you, those of you from Portuguese families, you know, you got engaged with some dialogues by your mother's sandal, most likely, right? You got engaged in some dialogues. Uh, love is not just blind affirmation. Love does not pat someone on the back and uh, tell them everything is okay as they engage in a pattern of self-destruction. Proverbs 27, verse 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. The most cherished, the most valuable people in your life are the people that will tell you what you don't want to hear because they love you. The most valuable people in your life are the people that will tell you things that they know may elicit a negative response from you in the short term, but they know in the long term that it will be good for you. And they love you enough to take that risk. Those are the people you should be hugging and kissing today. You know, it feels good to be affirmed. It feels good to be patted on the back. And these days, most of us are starved for any positive encouragement. That's for sure. But don't fall to the temptation of thinking that if you love somebody, that means you're never going to tell them hard things. We need true, we need abiding love. Dear believer, God's love for you is perfect. God's love for you is unwavering. Not because God just uh, pretends that you are not, uh, that you are what you are not. God doesn't just pretend that, that or, or He doesn't ignore your sins. The righteousness of Jesus Christ has been placed to your account. The blood of Jesus Christ has paid for your sins. Your sins have been triumphed over. And that's why I knew that today would be a good day to learn that new song. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. John chapter 1 and verse 14 describes the glory of the manifestation of Jesus. It says that Jesus Christ manifested the glory of God full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. I was reading a book recently, and uh, the book was called Was Christ God? And it gave an illustration of this. And the author said this, and I'm just going to read uh, the illustration that he gave. He says, let's suppose that a convict who had just finished his term of penal servitude wishes to lead an honest life. He comes to a man who has a large jewelry establishment and requires, and, and requires a night watchman. And he's engaged to watch this building through the quiet hours of the night when he has everything under his care and every opportunity to rob his employer. On the very first evening, he meets one of his old companions who questions him. What are you doing here? Oh, I'm the night watchman. You're a night watchman over this jewelry shop? Yes. Does your boss know what you are? 
Oh, no, no, please, please be silent. If he knew I would be, I would be fired. Suppose I let it out that you are, are, are a convict. Oh, please don't. It would be my last day here, and I wish to be honest. Well, you have to give me some money then to keep that quiet. And so the guy says, okay, very well. I just got to keep you quiet. I'll do, what it, I'll do what I have to do. It says, thus the poor man would be in sad fear and trembling, lest it should come to the ears of his employer what his previous character had been. Let us suppose, however, that instead of the employers engaging the man in ignorance of his character, he went to the convict's cell and said, now I know you. I know what you are. I know what you've done. I know every robbery you've committed and that you are worse than you believe yourself to be. I am about to give you a chance of becoming honest. I'll trust you as my night watchman over my valuable goods. The man is faithful at his post. He meets his old companion, one after the other, who threatened to inform upon him, and he asks, what will you tell about me? I'll tell him that you're a ringleader of housebreakers. My master knows all of those things better than you do. And of course, what happens? That silences his accusers altogether. And that would be an example of his employer being full of grace and truth. He's not showing grace to this person. He's not giving to this person because he doesn't know who he is. He knows full well who he is and pours out grace nonetheless. Men and women, God knows you better than you know yourself. God knows your sins. God knows the deepest, darkest sin of your life that not a soul on this earth has ever known, has ever dreamed the slightest bit of. God knows all about it. If you know Christ as your Savior, the grace of God has triumphed over that sin. That sin has been covered by the precious blood of Jesus and the righteousness of Jesus Christ has been lavished upon you so that all your sins have been completely overwhelmed and obliterated as far as the east is from the west, so far as he separated our sins from us cast into the depths of the sea, never to be remembered ever again. That's why 1 John 3, 1 says this, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the sons of God. What a thing to behold! It is amazing, it defies comprehension. It's overwhelming, it is overcoming love. It is something to behold. It is a love that remains in all that we go through. That's what the text describes for us. We face hard times. We could list the deepest and darkest of difficulties. I could give a list of, of things that would bring a tear to your eye to think of someone going through it. We could think of such things as physical abuse, betrayal by your closest, the people closest to you, Fraud, robbery, extortion, sexual abuse, marital inf inf infidelity, and even uh, murder. We live in a wicked, wicked world. We can list all of these things. And let me tell you something. You look around this congregation, there are people in this room that have been affected by each and every one of these deep, dark, and cruel things. We live in a wicked world and a cruel, cruel world. That's why Psalm 119 tells us that the only way to keep ourselves pure is by the careful application of the Word of God. All oh, men and women, we live in this wicked world and we find ourselves being affected. We find that sin clinging to us, right? I know uh, that uh, some of you uh, work in environments where the people that you work with are use some of the foulest language constantly and you have to hear it. You're subjected to that the whole day long and even if you don't say it, it's in your head. How does a young man, how does a person keep his way pure? By taking heed by the word of God. God's word is that which we need to cleanse ourselves of this sin. And that we wish 
that things would go our way. Though sometimes, and, and myself included, so often we, we pray, Lord, I just want to, Lord, would you please give me a good day today? We always want that, don't we? We want things to go our way. We want people around us to be happy about us and happy for us and happy with us. But it doesn't always happen that way. God providentially uses hard times to shape us. The harshest of circumstances don't have the power to sever us from God's love. As I said before, if God is for us, who could be against us? And you know what? The devil knows the Bible. The devil knows the Word. Can you imagine as the Spirit of God insp inspired those words? The legions of hell saying, we will take that challenge. We'll take it. The devil wants to separate you from the love of Christ. He can't do it. Nothing, no harsh circumstance has the power to sever us from God's love. He gives examples here. He says, Sal, tribulation, and the idea of the word tribulation is like the squeeze, like, like taking a grape and squeezing it to get the juice out of it. All right? Tribulation, that which squeezes you. Shall tribulation. Shall distress, and that has the idea of a narrow place when we are when we feel that we are hemmed in by our circumstances. I have nowhere to go. I have limited options as to what I can do. Shall tribulation, shall distress, shall persecution, and that speaks of people suffering specifically because of their Christianity. Remember, the believers at Rome were facing physical persecution because of their faith. Shall persecution, shall famine, nakedness, peril, that is dangerous circumstances, even sword, shall any of these things separate us from the love of Christ? God is working in all of these things. Troubles, pressures, obligations, they pile upon us every day. And you know what it's like, don't you? You begin your day, and you say, okay, you, you clock in for work, right? Or maybe it's the Saturday at home, and you say, okay, I've got this list of things that need to be done. And you, uh, you, you launch out into accomplishing that list of things that you have to do. Invariably, what's going to happen? As you go throughout your day, you're going to get this curveball thrown at you. You're going to get that phone call that requires your attention. You're going to have this unforeseen thing come up that needs to be addressed, and you don't have a choice of kicking the can down the road. It needs to be addressed then. So what do you do constantly? You constantly kind of reshuffle the deck, don't you? Okay, I, I thought I had a full plate of what I needed to do today. I can squeeze it in. Yeah, I can do it. Okay, I figured it out. I got it. And then another thing comes, and you just, ah, all right, and you figure it out. Okay, I can still get it done. And then that one thing comes, right? You have, you have manipulated your day as much as you can. You have reshuffled the deck as many times as you can, and then there's that one more thing that hits, and what happens? You break. You break. You know, we use that, that, uh, that idiom, it's like the straw that broke the camel's back. You get that event that hits you. Sometimes it's, a big, sometimes it's a big thing, and sometimes it can be a small thing that just comes at, a, at an inopportune time. Something happens and you break. Sometimes God wants to get us to that breaking point to strip us of all of that prideful self-sufficiency, that we will rush to Him, that we will lean upon Him. Finally, in Luke chapter 22, verse 31, this passage is so, it's like looking in the mirror. Uh, the Lord tells Peter, He said, P uh, Peter, Satan has desired to have you that he would sift you like wheat. And that is a vicious process of beating down 
Satan has desired to have you that he would sift you like wheat. You imagine Peter hearing Jesus' words and saying, all right, yeah, you rebuked him, right? You told the devil to get away. You tell the devil to go back where he came from, didn't you, Jesus? What did Jesus say? He says, but I have prayed for you, Peter, so that when you have returned, what did he imply by that? You're going to fail, Peter. You're going to fail. When you've returned, that you would strengthen your brothers. We don't like to hear things like that. We don't like to hear that God is providentially going to even allow the devil to, 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 to bring temptation and, and uh, difficult things into our lives that would threaten to upend our faith. We don't like that. God uses it. In Hebrews 11, there's a great list of people who saw God do great things. And it says this person did this by faith. That person by faith did the other thing. They triumphed. And we read those passages and we say, yes, I want to be in that bunch of people. I want to be like those that, that see God do wonderful things by faith. I like that. But then as you read through Hebrews 11, you get to the end of it. And what does it say? It says, then others by faith were killed with the sword. Were sawn asunder. Brutal. It's horrible. Destitute, afflicted, tormented. You say, hold on a second. I thought faith is victory. I thought faith was everything working out. You're telling me that some of these people suffered by faith? You're telling me that some of these people by faith went to the sword? You're telling me that by faith some people were put into a block and literally sawn in half? You're telling me that's by faith? That's what the Bible says. And then it gives this accolade toward those it says, of these, the world is not worthy. They suffered by faith. Verse 37, chapter 8, says, Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. The word more than conquerors is actually one word. Remember back in chapter 5, another one of my favorite verses from Romans. It says, and I, and I think I've actually quoted this verse a couple of times today already. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. The word is superabounded. It uses the, pre, the Greek prefix huper. Huper abounded. Superabound. And the word more than conquerors, it is a huper conqueror, a super abounder. In all of these things, we are super conquerors through him who loved us. They are these events, these things that beat us down, these things that the devil tries to upend and overturn our faith by... They are conquered, not because God strips them away, not, be, not because God does away with them, or not because God strips away uh, any ability for them to do, our har do us any harm. They are, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. None of these things can hinder his loving purpose. None of these things can separate us from the love of Christ. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17, says, that, says of the believer that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Think about that. He doesn't say, I'm not going to allow any weapon to, uh, to be formed against you. He doesn't say that, does he? He says there are going to be weapons formed against you. I won't allow any of them to do what they want to do. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. They will not succeed in thwarting God's purpose of good in the life of the believer. So in hard times, we rest in the reality of His unchanging love and we pray for God's grace 
Men and women, as you face difficulties, as you face afflictions, you need to bathe those afflictions, bathe those difficulties in prayer. A prayerless affliction is like an open sore, ripe for infection. Pray through your afflictions. The second thing I see this morning is that it's a love that will remain in every potential. You know, some of the most destructive words in the English language are the words, what if? What if? Right? What if this? What if that? Those two little words, some of you have lost entire nights of sleep by those two little words. What if this happens? What if that happens? What if that happens? And your mind can go a million different extreme directions all at the same time if you let those two words dominate you. The love of God in Christ is powerful over every potential. They are bigger than any what if. If I live in weakness, if I struggle in my health, even if I die in pain, Philippians 1.21 says, For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. 2 Corinthians 12 says that the strength of God is shown in its completion in our weakness. So that when we are weak, he is, His strength is made manifest. We need to embrace weakness because God works in a powerful way in our arenas of weakness. And I think sometimes we are so fixated on strengthening our positions of weakness that we rob ourselves of blessing that God has ordained in that weakness. Isaiah chapter 43 Verse 1 says this, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. Doesn't change. You're mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flames scorch you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. You know, those that think about, meditate on those verses, we don't like hearing these things, do we? It'd be much easier for us to hear something, God's not going to let you pass through the waters. God's going to dry up the waters. God's going to part the waters so you can pass through on dry ground every time. God's not going to let you walk through the fire. God's not going to let you go through the rivers. But God says what? No, you're going to go through the waters. You're going to go through the rivers. You're going to go through the fires. But in all of those things, you are going to find my overwhelming grace. You are going to find my overwhelming strength so that you're able to say with David in Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. God is going to be with you in the darkest, ugliest, most difficult circumstances in life. Dear believer, you can know that by faith. Don't let go of that. Don't let go. It is a love that will remain in every extreme potential. It says, whether it be angels, principalities, or powers... Colossians 1.16 says that principalities and powers, angels and demons were created, and get this, by him and for him. There's not a demon in hell that can act contrary to what God allows that demon to do. Not one. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12 says that we wrestle in spiritual warfare. Yes, we do. We wrestle against those principalities and powers, but ultimately Jesus Christ conquers. He says, whether it be things present, whether it be things to come, whether it's what is going on in your life, whether it's what might happen, and that's what gets you, doesn't it? 
That's what keeps you awake at night. There's some of you that you worry about anything and everything, don't you? You are worriers. You know, they say that worry is scientifically proven to work. Why? Because 99% of what you worry about never happens. That's the truth, right? Worry, C.H. Spurgeon said, worry doesn't rob today of its troubles. It only robs us of our strength. Some of you lay in bed and you're worrying about what might happen here, what might happen there. What does the word say here? Whether it's things present or things to come, what might happen, what is happening, even what will happen, can't separate you from the love of Christ. He says, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created being. You name it. You go high, you go low, you go east, you go west, you go deep, you go wide. Wherever you go, wherever you may travel, whatever happens in your life, none of these things can separate you as a believer from the love of Christ. Nothing can make him give you up. Nothing. Nothing can cut you off from Jesus. John chapter 10 and verse 28 describes his unstoppable will. He said, I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Jesus said in John chapter 17, he said, I will that these whom you have given me, they would be with me where I am. Men and women, that is the will of Jesus to take you home to glory. And there is nothing that Jesus wills to do that he has stopped short of doing. It is his unstoppable love. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. If God is for us, who can be against us? Oh, demons in hell, take up that charge. Take up that challenge. You will fail to separate the weakest saint from the love of his Savior. Several years ago, there was a company, still see their advertisements, and they were advertising their service of keeping your identity and your credit safe. And uh, from what I understand, they do a pretty good job. They charge too much money for me. I'm cheap. But uh, the CEO of that company did a commercial. And he went on the, on the commercial. He said, okay, I'm going to prove how good our company is. Here is my social security number. And he gave his social security number in the commercial and said, try to steal my identity. Guess what happened? They did. <laughs> you heard every scam artist on the planet take up that challenge. You got a deal. We're stealing it. If God's for us, who can be against us? Take every demon in hell gathered together against the weakest child of God. They will never separate you from one iota of the love of God in Christ toward you. Can't do it. Think about Job. Satan's purpose was to cut Job off from the love of God. That's what Satan wanted to do. He told God, you stop feathering Job's pillow. You stop giving Job good things. You stop blessing Job. Job will curse you. He will deny you. He will hate you. The entire book of Job describes all of the hatred of hell let loose against this child of God. And understand something, the hatred of hell that was directed against Job, the devil hates you just that much. Just that much. Job struggled. Job faltered. Job sinned. But in the end, at the end of the story, Job was as much in the hand of his Redeemer as he was in chapter 1. Nothing had changed. The sustaining power was not in the strength of Job's faith. It was in the object of his faith, his Savior, that he saw through it all. The sovereign purpose of God to save him and to keep him. And God used even Satan's vicious cruelty to purify Job. 
And the same thing is true for you. If you know Christ as your Savior, same thing is true in all these things. God doesn't say, I'm going to keep you back from all these things. These things are going to come your way. Peril, sword, distress, persecution. All of these things may come your way, but in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. If He didn't love us, we would be failures in all of them. But in Him who loved us, there is nothing that can separate the believer from the love of Christ. We're like the disciples as they boarded the boat to cross the Sea of Galilee with Jesus. And Jesus said to them, we're going to the other side. They faced the storm, and they got in the middle of the storm, and they cried, Jesus, don't you care? We're going to die. They forgot that Jesus said, we're getting in the boat. We're going to the other side. Dear believer, God has said to you, when he saved you, he said, we're going to the other side. We're going home to glory. I will take you. I'm going to be with you every step of the way. You are going to be in heaven. You will be glorified. You can't stop that launch sequence. It's already been enacted. God set His sovereign grace upon you to save you, and that same sovereign grace is taking you all the way home. Doesn't mean you're not going to struggle. Doesn't mean you're not going to have difficulties. But none of those things are more powerful than the almighty, sovereign, saving decree of our God. Hallelujah for that. Let's all pray. Oh, Father. These are rich, precious truths bigger than we can even wrap our minds around. But we rejoice. We rejoice. Oh, how wonderful it is that in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. And whether it be temptations, whether it be persecutions or peril or sword or height or depth, what is uh, present, what is uh, the things to come, Whatever it is, let loose what they will. They can't separate us from the sovereign love of our Savior. Oh, Lord, would you rest this wonderful reality home upon our hearts. Oh, Lord, may we go away from this place walking on cloud nine of heaven because it's so great, it's so big, more than we are ever worthy of. Lord, work in our hearts. Get our eyes rejoicing in our Savior today. For it's in His precious name we pray. Amen.